First question is going to be almost a uh, opening statement sort of uh, question, and why are you running for the position of Jackson County Commission? And so we'll let uh, Commissioner Doug Breidenfall uh, handle that one first. He has 90 seconds. Well, basically, I've been in office for the last this term. I'd like to continue a lot of work I've done, and if we can turn phones off, everybody, and <laughs> I would appreciate that so it wouldn't disturb anybody. Basically, I've positioned myself in Jackson County to be able to be very successful over the next for next term. And we've positioned Jackson County to be very influential on nationally on a lot of major issues that are be facing us. Not everything from public lands to health care, transportation. I'll be taking over the presidency of the National Association of Western Air State Region in May. And that is representing the counties for 15 Western states, 551 counties. It's parallel to the Western Governors Association. So I'll be working directly with them to be able to take care of some of these issues that affect all of us here in the West, not just in Jackson County, and, but at the same time, taking care of the issues that we're dealing with in Jackson County while we're doing that work. And we'll go into a lot of those details as we move forward with this forum. We don't have to pass mics, that's nice. Yeah, now we, everyone has their own microphone. Uh, Gordon Chalstrom. Howdy, my name's Gordon Chalstrom and I'm a businessman. I've been a businessman in this valley for 23 years. I've got seven grandchildren in this valley, and the bottom line is I don't want to have to see them move away to get a family wage jobs. I see family wage jobs as being vital to this economy. The median income is $36,000. That does not afford you enough money to be able to buy a home. We're being priced out of homes. We're being marketed out of jobs. The rules, the regulations, and the fees are so instrumental in keeping jobs from coming here, we need to take a hard look at that. It's for our children's future, my grandchildren's future, and your future I'm working for. I've been a hard-working man my whole life, and I'll take that hard work and dedication to the job. Thank you. And Bob Strasser. Good evening. I'm Bob Strasser, and like Mr. Chalstrom, I'm also a businessman. I'm an independent contractor and have been for about 23 years. And uh, besides that, I have a great family that's here. Several of the great, uh, several of the grandchildren. My wife Phyllis is in the back. And while I only have eight grandchildren, only three of them are actually here. My education is in Pepperdine. My other background is a commander with the police department in Southern California. All total, I have about 42 years in the public sector. That includes 16 years on the city council, also the budget committee, and currently the Medford Water Commission. I believe that I have a strong public policy background and a sound reputation with the people who know me. I feel we need wise land use policies. We need to encourage economic development, protect property rights, and we certainly need to do something about the public safety issues with the jail and the closure of the 60 beds in the basement and the return of people to our community that are out there doing more things rather than being in a place of custodial care where they belong. I think the first thing I would do if I were on the Board of Commissioners is establish some coordination with the other communities, attend their meetings, interact with them, because I think the partnership is strengthening to our valley, our county. And I think currently that is not what is happening. I would like to see them feel, and you, that we care about what your voices have to say. We want you to feel like you've been heard and that we are accountable for the decisions we make. Thank you very much. Next question, we start with Gordon Chalstrom. Gordon, if you were elected county commissioner, what will be your top three priorities upon entering office? removing and eliminating uh, burdensome regulations and fees that inhibit job growth, management of our natural resources through a coordinated effort. We're currently as listed as a cooperating agency and that doesn't give us a seat at the table. And I also believe that uh, the health and safety of the county uh, is a very top priority. Uh, we need to fully fund the jails. This book and release uh, is uh, putting our citizens at risk and we need to make sure that uh, if you do the crime, you do the time. Thank you. Mr. Strasser. Well, I've already alluded to it. I want sound public policy. I want wise land use decisions to protect property rights. 
and I've already articulated quite a bit about public safety, and I'll get into more of that probably later. All right, very good. Uh, Commissioner Brian Paul. Well, we have a lot of the same likes, and public safety is a priority. I don't know if many of you know this, but Jackson County has a caseload that is going to demand three new judges here. We've already put the request in for those three new judges. Now, with that being said, I sit on the task force for the Chief Justice for the State of Oregon for the courthouse facilities. We determine where the money is going to be sent for the upgrades and what new facilities are going to be built within the state. Helping prioritize that in Jackson County and house those new judges when they do get here sometime in the next several biennium is going to be critical. That jail is also an issue. You've been hearing me call out for a... Uh, a program review of our criminal justice system. It's because our jail was basically told to us that we need to replace it over a decade ago. And now we haven't dealt with that for the last decade, so now we're trying to find ways to deal with that in the future. Land and public land and, pu and private land is priorities to me. Those who know me know that I've been working hard on that for the last three years. We're making headway. I have community wildfire protection plans that we've been developing over the last couple of years is going to give us coordination standing in a way we've never had it in the past because it's plan to plan, not just people pounding their fists saying that oh, I want. And I finally found a way to unlock some of the private lands. So those are people who want to develop some of their, their lands. You can look at a case I just did last week on um, EFU converting it back into rural residential and dividing a parcel that no one said could be divided. So that type of stuff, I can show I have a track record of actually performing what I said I was going to do. And last but not least is our budget. And if you look, when I took office, we were in a seven, eight million dollar deficit, dwindled our reserves down to about 20 million. We're now back up to 38 million in reserves and we're in a surplus budget. I'm gonna add a uh, question in reference to something I've heard from all three candidates. And what specifically would you do, or do you think is the uh, proper path to take with the Jackson County Jail in itself. And uh, Bob, you'll be the first one on this one, Mr. Strasser. I'm probably the only one sitting here that's actually designed the jail facility. The facility is outmoded. There are safety standards, which also are safety standards not only for the custodial staff, but the inmates themselves to make sure they don't hurt each other. I'm not sure that our jail facility is up to that. But more importantly is the issue of keeping the jail beds open. We heard a uh, comment about we're going to need three new local judges. Well, that's probably quite true as we release them continually instead of keeping them in custody. The other issue is people are going out committing crimes and they know they're not going to be held in there if it's a nonviolent crime. So we have this increasing cycle, recidivism, higher crime rate, You've seen the reports on the car burglaries here throughout the county, Eagle Point, Medford. Same guys getting released all the time. It's not that we have so many people doing things. We have a certain number of people doing a lot of things. Long term, replace it. We have a linear style jail. The new technology is a podular style jail. Linear jail takes a lot of personnel to be able to manage the inmates. Podular style, you can eliminate a large portion of your workforce by maintaining uh, control of the inmates with just one or two people. I've been touring jails across the state and, and the, the nation, basically looking at which the new technology, if we're going to have to be able to do that. Not saying that we will. Part of that will be determined through this program review that we're asking from the National Institute of Corrections. They'll come in there and they'll give us a recommendation of what that should look like and where we need to move forward. That, that review will be very beneficial for Jackson County. Now, we, let's talk a little bit about releasing inmates. Frankly, shutting down that uh, floor of the jail was the sheriff's decision based on overtime issues and staffing issues. We were burning our deputies out. We were having lawsuit increases, which cost the citizens in Jackson County more money. Shutting that floor down was a prudent move because we did not have the staffing. The commissioners did increase the staffing in this year's budget and approved the FTEs for the sheriff to do that. The problem is there's a shortage right now of law enforcement across the state due to retirements. The state of Oregon has increased several million dollars to the Department of Public Standards and, Trade and Safety just to accommodate the amount of people going through the program and to add additional recruit classes. So we've, we're in recruitment process. I had this conversation with the sheriff just yesterday. We're trying to get people in. The hard part is 
the people aren't out there to come work right now. So we're having a difficult time getting them in. But the FTEs are there, and we want to reopen. And what's the FTE? Full-time equivalent employee. Gordon? I also believe we need to do jail. But I also believe that the citizens of Jackson County can't afford a tax increase to do it. When we come up with the plan to build a new jail, we're going to have to cut other budget, other items in the budget. With the median income of 36000 the taxes are already at the highest level that we can afford. So we have to be very prudent about it. As a businessman, you have to prioritize and make decisions on what is most important and what the people want. And that's something I would do. If the citizens of Jackson County want health and safety first, and I believe they do, then that should be our priority. And we're going to have to look at the other departments and see where we can come up with that money. Just raising the budget is not the answer. We need to take care of it, and we need to take care of our citizens at the same time. Next question, having to do with the structure of county government, and uh, we're going to direct this one to Doug Breitenthal first. How do you perceive the county commission's role, and what about the relationship between the role and administrative staff? Are we in the right, uh, the right mode right now, or do we need to make some changes? If so, what would that be? I think I've come out and I've basically said this already. After three years, for those who don't know me, I have over 25, 27 years experience within public service. I was a fire chief prior to coming here. And I work for the national, the federal government also on national incident management teams. The structure of our government is outlined very clearly within our charter. All the th legislative, uh, administrative, and quasi-judicial authority rests within the commissioners. We have that authority. We delegate that authority out as we see fit. Now, the commissioners of the past have given a lot of that authority away through board orders or ordinances through different two staff, mostly through the administrator. Personally, I believe that it's time that we take a look at restructuring some of that process within Jackson County. Currently, the commissioners only have one employee. That's the administrator. Everybody else works for the commissioners. I think we should start dividing that into three places underneath the commissioners. County council needs to work for the commissioners. The administrator needs to work for the commissioners, and audit needs to be look, work for the commissioners directly. By doing that, it gives us the ability to say, okay, council, give us a little more information on this. Right now, as we hire, we just hired a new county council, and a commissioner did not have the ability to sit in or have any say on who that county council was going to be. Councils are like doctors. They have opinions. You want to know which council you're going to have to determine where you're going to move forward because those opinions change and vary and, and their expertise changes and varies. So for the commissioner saying we want a path that goes down this direction you want to, and set good policy on that, you want to have, be able to say council, is this the kind of per, the fit that we have and the commissioners currently don't have say over that. I agree with several portions of his comments. I mean, when you go to an attorney, you don't send your uh, bookkeeper into the attorney to get uh, the review. You gotta be able to deal with the county council on a one-on-one -on -one basis. So I agree with that realignment. Uh, Danny Jordan has done a fine job of administering the funds in this county. But I do believe that we need to have a top-down look and check all of the departments. Uh, we need to get in there and do a cost-based analysis on every department, and make sure that they're not wasting money. We, because it's your money. This is stuff that, you know, I, as a businessman, I watch every penny I spend, and that's the approach I'm gonna take when I work for the county. And we have to get our hands dirty and our boots dirty and get out there and check on these departments to see how they're operating. I'm not gonna sit in my office and, and look at a report or a budget report. I'm going to be out there, I'm going to be looking at it, and I'm going to make the determination of what's best for the county. And if some of that is outsourcing it so that we can be more efficient, so be it. That's what we need to do. But it's your tax dollars I'm looking out for. And that's the number one job is fiduciary responsibility. Thank you. I think basically the current form of county administration that we have is fine. I think Danny Jordan has done a great job I hold no illusions about what the role of the county commissioners are. That's to set the policy and goals and the overall management of the county, and they can delegate as they see fit. In terms of the interviewing of attorneys for who's to be county council, well, we have one county commissioner who is an attorney. 
And I wish he could have participated in that. I think it might have been helpful because he would be the one that I feel would be really qualified to judge the qualifications of another attorney. In terms of the budget issues, first of all, I'm going to define the budget. The budget is the level of service you folks are willing to afford. And that budget is also the tool to accomplish whatever we want to accomplish in the goals and policies for the county. So the money needs to be targeted towards those things that it's supposed to accomplish. In other words, you allocate the funds to accomplish the goals that you've asked people to do. In terms of the jail facility, I think you need to recognize another cost to our county. And that's one that's hard to measure. And the impact on the deputies that are now being stressed out, from what I'm hearing, overworked, you bet, with the revolving door that we've got in there, and it was 60 beds, I believe, in the basement that was closed. I think that's something the folks ought to weigh in on and have the choice of making a decision on. New building, rather, with a new jail. Right. And uh, re modular remote supervision, I believe, is the term that Mr. Breidenthal was looking for. Okay, very good. Now, I was going to add that uh, from this point forward, at the, after all three commissioners end up, or, or commissioner candidates, rather, all three commissioners, that's interesting. <laughs> but uh, after everyone answers a question, if anybody wants to jump in and, uh, and ask for a little bit of rebuttal, we could do about 30 seconds after each question for that. If, if somebody wanted to challenge somebody on something being said, although this is not an official debate per se. All right, uh, next uh, question here. Uh, Gordon Charlstrom will start here. As a commissioner, what would you do to create an environment friendly to job creators in Jackson County? That's what I am as a job creator. And as a builder, the number one most expensive line item on building a building or opening a business are the fees and regulations that you have to go through. That is the biggest hindrance to people wanting to come to the Valley. There, there are some options we can do there. You know, we need manufacturing jobs. I don't believe we should wipe the fees away, but what I, th I think we can do is make a system where they're paid for over a longer term so that it's a less of a burden on the people coming into the valley. And that's the, the best and easiest way to do it, I believe. We still need the services that those companies uh, require, water, sewer, power, so on and so forth. But it's a big expense right out the gate. And most of these small businesses and medium-sized manufacturers, uh, they just don't want to deal with that. It's quite a hindrance. Yeah, it is a loud clunk. Huh? Yeah. So I, I said mine down, I didn't want to bother. In terms of the fees, I think the thing that fees need to be, and it's a requirement that there be a nexus between what's being charged and the service performed. So the question then becomes, are they reasonably assessing what's required? And if they're not, I'd like it changed. What I want to see encouraged here is basically small business as opposed to so much of the large business. Large business is great, but when they leave, they hurt. So I not only want to encourage the small business with a climate that is conducive to them coming here, I want to retain the ones we've already got. I want to see the jobs here. And in terms of, there, there have been a number of of other things mentioned that inhibit people coming here, and some of its property values. For the last 23 years, I've been a principal broker for an office, and that's, that's where I earn my own check. And there's 50 other people in our office that depend on us managing it right. I'd like to see better levels of housing in terms of affordability. That doesn't mean cheap. That means sound, affordable homes. Our land use laws make that very difficult. When we start talking about enterprise zones and drilling, making jobs, and being able to create economic development, we do exactly what Jackson County is doing right now. We just eliminated the permit fee for businesses that want to move into an enterprise zone. That is, does exactly what was just talked about. We're already down that path. We invest in people that are looking to bring those small businesses here to Jackson County, and we do grant programs to help bring them along. That's exactly what we're doing. Right now, currently, Jackson County is investing about $125,000 annually for a person to come and recruit high-tech businesses, small high-tech businesses into Jackson County. And not just high-tech, but other industry, manufacturing industries also. 
Now, with that being said, jobs are part of that piece. If you don't work with the universities and the colleges and the high schools to develop a program that makes the, having a workforce, it, it doesn't work. Our biggest issue isn't fee costs or land availability, it's our workforce. We don't have the skilled, trained workforce in the Jackson County to be able to bring these large jobs or even a lot of these smaller jobs here. The, more, the, the companies we have have a hard time finding employees and retaining those employees today. So land availability is very critical to that also, and the fee structure is very critical. However, I think those skilled workforce and education of our youth so, and they're helping them along to be able to be skilled is probably one of the most critical pieces we can do. All right, anybody want to challenge anyone on anything they've heard? So far, so good? All right, on to the next one. Uh, Bob, you'll take this one uh, first here. Recent commission meetings have been uh, discussing the purchase of 352 acres of private land by a nonprofit, and at some point it uh, could be effectively removed from the tax rolls. Part of the purchase likely to be using government grant money. While the commissioners are not directly part of the decision making on this, what is your position on this tactic? Basically, I'm always a little nervous when it's grant money, because there's always a string to whatever is given. Taking land out of availability and closing roads in other areas, limiting access to some of the land that's around us that we came here for and enjoy is not something I'm very happy about. I would rather that that didn't happen. I think we can do well to preserve our own lands here. I think people who live here know and care about their land. I don't think we need others telling us how we should be caring about it. I think we can do fine on our own. Well, let's just cut straight to the chase. There's those who want to take the Rogue River from the dam all the way to the, the confluence of the Applegate River and turn it into a wild and scenic section and give a designation as such. In the documentation that was brought before the board, one of the, one of the groups basically made the claim that they want to start buying up this land and doing that. Now, with that being said, Jackson County has also weighed in because of our own property and said we're not going to buy off that the wild and scenic destination can be used in this portion because we have agreements right now with the, net, with the feds on certain pieces that Jackson County does own that we have intent to develop in the future. And there's so much development on that land already that it no longer qualifies for designation as wild and scenic. So in getting to the point on the grants itself, let's be straight up. As a commissioner, you are a quasi-judicial and you're expected to make judicial decisions over that land. You have to be fair and impartial to all people in Jackson County. So in this particular case, this is a OEB grant. Jackson County cannot say yes or no on it. We have no way in on it. We'd have no input. But here's what we can do. We can come back and say, we don't agree with that funds being able to be purchased for land, but as soon as we do, organizations like the Motorcycle Riders Association that use those same funds to buy land to make it available for people, it goes away for the other side also. So you have to be very careful because there's thousands of acres of being purchased up right now by user groups access for everybody, that that would stop if you were to fight over 300, 352 acres. The issue on the Southern Oregon Land Conservancy is the fact that them obtaining money, taxpayer dollars, to buy it, and then you go 15 miles down river, the Nature Conservancy near the Table Rocks is attempting to get some more land. What the, that would do is they would be happy to create a 15-mile section of wild and scenic on the Rogue River, and that would severely inhibit the property rights of the people that live along that section of the river. I do not believe we should use any taxpayer-funded money to be buying this land. I went to the road closure meeting in Ashland last Wednesday, and there was one number that stuck out in my brain. I, I can't forget it. 12,288 acres. Since that was designated a monument under Clinton in the year 2000, that's how many acres the government has bought. Those were workable 
ranches and farms that were taken off the tax rolls. That's almost 20 square miles of tax base that's been eliminated off of this county. We need to fight very hard to maintain our tax base because you guys are going to end up making up the difference. And that's the way it's going to be. If we want to maintain our services, that's the way it's going to be. We need to stand up and fight this fight and protect the property rights of everybody on the river, not just these environmental groups. Thank you. Bob, did you start last time? Yeah. Okay, all right. Sorry, I'm starting to lose a little count. Sorry about that. Yeah, go right ahead. Go right ahead, Doug. I don't want anybody to get the wrong opinion. When they, when this land is purchased through these grants, they they stay on the tax roll. It's not being pulled off the tax roll. The monument stuff. There's a lot of private land still in the monument, but if, when it converts into federal trust, then it gets pulled off the tax roll. So to say that this land is being come off the tax roll would be lying to people, and I don't think that would be appropriate. I have a question. I mean, in the budget, in the, in the valuation, when they talk about getting this uh, uh, $2.5 million, they budgeted four years of maintenance on that piece of property. At the end of the four years, their intent is to give it over to the BLM, and it will come off the tax rolls. Look at their own paperwork. That's what's going to happen. We need to fight it. We need to do some research and understand this. All right. Uh, next question, uh, Doug Breidenthal will take this one. Coordination. Of course, we've talked about coordination before. It's been touted as the solution to some of our challenges regarding logging on federal lands here in Jackson County. What is your opinion on coordination? What does it mean? Well, this is one of the uh, apex pieces that I've been working on for the last three years. Coordination is not a commissioner walking into the federal office and saying, talk to me on how we're going to manage this. Anybody that believes that is basically, uh, they need to readdress and read FLIPMA and really what it's about. The National Forest Management Act, the FLIPMA on the BLM side, basically says a county or a jurisdiction has to have local planning in place. That planning is now put in, is now coordinated with the federal plan as it emerges prior to going to NGO. Well, that means going public or into the nonprofits or anybody else having input on it. So government to government conversation based on established plans. Our plans in Jackson County have been very weak in the past, even though our ordinances have been well written. So over the last three years, I have worked with the AFRC, American Forest Resource Council. We have developed new legal framework for one of our key land management plans, our, our wildfire protection plan. They will give us the ability to say, what the prescription will look like on that federal land, and it's using the health, safety, and welfare of the community. We now have the ability to say, because of that fire and the 2.5 particulate level that it's causing in our community, little Johnny just went to the hospital with asthma. And that, that now, that cost with the Oregon Health Plan or that cost to the health insurance is now being pointed back at that fire and that land management practice. And it says that our plan now has the ability to start writing that prescription based on the comprehensive risk analysis that is the first time that's ever been done in the nation that anybody can find. And that's where it's really important to finish that work. The Northwest Forest Plan also calls out specifically the social and economic values of the community need to be put in, need to be taken into account. It's not very hard to figure out that we have been harmed by the management practices of this uh, Forest Service and BLM over the last 30 years. The simple fact is, in spite of what the commissioner says, we are still listed as a cooperating agency. And as such, we do not have a seat at the table. The first thing we have to do, which is to show the harm that's been affected upon the people of Jackson County, and then you can move for coordination. Now, coordination is a congressional mandate. Yeah. It is. It's, I'm sorry, it's a congressional mandate, and we need to be enforcing it and using it as a tool to get back into the local management practices that have sustained these counties for decades. Yeah. We get to the issue of uh, coordination or cooperation. I think we need a seat at the table, and I think that's the thrust of the letter that the county commissioners and Commissioner Bridenthal even signed back in July of 2015. 
And basically what it says, in our view, the BLM has failed to coordinate or cooperate with the county. They failed to take into account their policies, their procedures, the harm it does to our county. And the PM standards, PM 10, PM 2.5, that's a particular matter in the air. And uh, we have a great deal of problems with that every time we do anything. The 1937 ONC Act requires that the lands be have been classified as timberlands and shall be managed for permanent forest production and the timber thereon shall be sold, cut, and removed in conformity with the principles of sustained yield. Nobody wants to damage the forest. We want it to be sustainable. That has been totally abrogated. There was in the last several legislative sessions, things presented by Congress, forwarded to the Senate, and the Senate took absolutely no action. So I would ask where our federal senators are in this. In the Bush administration, there was things put in place at the end of his term that would have solved this problem, and it was promptly repealed in the first months of the Obama administration. So yes, we deserve a place at the table. I think that would help all of us and it would help all the ONC counties. All right, anybody want to dig in anything or counter something? I know there's a lot to, to try to do in 90 seconds on that particular question. Maybe we should have made it two, but yeah, we'll I'm going to ask for, this is a, a very hot topic. I'm going right. to ask for everybody to have a little more time on this one. It's really critical. We do have a seat at the table. For the first time in our history, we have a seat at the table. The Senate is acting on it right now. Uh, 1526 which was the original piece that came out of Congress, and the 2647, which was out of Bishop's office here recently and passed by the House. A lot of those pieces of uh, categorical exclusions and how to manage that came out of my office, uh, working with Walden directly and with Representative Bishop directly through my position on the national side. I recently came back from D.C. Murkowski and Cantwell are both are moving forward with a piece that just is in, they came out with their uh, legislative piece that's going to committee. That has pieces in there that talks about the Community Wildfire Protection Plan and gives us, the counties, a lot more leverage at the coordination piece than it's ever done before. Understanding that the counties and some of the region cannot afford this, we also met with the interior appropriations for the Senate and they basically agreed to about $40 million over four years, $10 million per year allocated out to the counties to be able to fund these wildfire protection plans to be able to write the prescription locally. Now, if you have one county doing it, that's nice. But if you have 551 counties doing it, that's a statement. And that's what we're working for. Cantwell and Murkowski have, uh, are moving forward on things right now, and we have uh, the administration who's committed to us that, they're willing to, that he's willing to sign it. So we just have to get to a full vote of the Senate right now. That's where that currently stands. It's just sort of a legislative update so people know what's really transpiring as time goes by. Okay, anybody else want to get anything there? Gordon? Well, that 41 million, is that the allocated money for 40 million? But you divide that by 551 counties. That isn't very much money to develop a fire safety plan. But, you know, we need we have the case already made that it's catastrophic fire levels. You know, the state's spending money every year buying insurance on it. And, and then it's only for a small amount, and then after that the feds come in. I mean, we've got to do more than fly around and talk about this. We've got to stay here and get some work done on it. It's $40 million and it is divided up. It's about $60,000, $70,000 per county is what it comes out to. That's what it just costs Jackson County to develop ours. Ours is going to be the framework for this. And just so everybody knows also, we are not a cooperating agency like was stated earlier. We refuse to sign the document. And I, I think you pointed that out, Bob, very clearly. We did not sign on like the other counties because we maintained our coordination rights and we refused to give them away. You know, all three county commissioners signed the document, and I guess my statement still stays. Where have these federal senators been for several years? And I'm glad to hear the update. I, I'm, I'm not as well-traveled as you are, Commissioner Breidenthal. So I'm glad to hear the update, and I think that's progress. And the progress needs to be on a firm, solid, legal foundation. You don't get things done by pounding on tables or any of that. You get them done by approaching them in the life that they live. 
which is by the legalities. All right, I'm going to go to a uh, audience question here. This is really interesting. Talking a lot about this on the show with the legalization of marijuana. Uh, Gordon, this will be, <laughs> I know. I can see. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, dude. Uh, Gordon. Uh, with the legalization of marijuana in our temperate climate, uh, this person expects an influx of people uh, coming to grow, smoke, use, and expecting a bumper crop of high-grade marijuana. And since it can't be exported, we may have some cheap marijuana or increased black market. How will we fund or deal with the strain on the county resources to deal with this? Gordon, you want to take a stab at that? Well, as a businessman, I'm more concerned about the workforce. You know, uh, the testing of the uh, marijuana is a big problem. Uh, if someone takes a smokes a bowl or a pipe or a, a joint at night and they get in an accident Monday morning at work and it still shows up in their bloodstream. We definitely need an updated test so that we can calculate the nanoparts that are in your body that are active and the nanoparts that are in your body passive. As an employer, this is a real issue. I do drug testing pre-employment and then, you know, if somebody gets in an accident, then we do drug testing. If they have it in their system, most often they're denied their claim. So we need to look at that seriously. You know, the rules and regulations are still being written on the marijuana issue. It's, a, it's an ever-evolving, uh, moving target. And I'm going to abstain from coming up with any solutions until we get this target to sit still because, like I said, the rules are constantly changing here. All right. Bob? What a great topic for a retired police officer. <laughs> uh, one of my things was working narcotics. And in terms of the issue of marijuana, you know, we've got the fact that it's a law now in this state that certain things can be done. What I'd really like to see is to start with the federal government taking off Schedule 1, where it actually doesn't belong, and then having some legitimate research in terms of the medical issues on it. And I'm concerned when I look at some of the municipalities that they've focused on the taxation issue. This shouldn't be about taxation. It should be about health and safety. And that's why we passed the laws to begin with. I think it's an evolving area. I think we send a very poor message to our kids when we legalized it. Because now we're going to tell all the kids under 18 who aren't legally able to do this that it's no big deal. Let's just do it. What are we going to do with the drivers out there on the road and the accidents that are happening when they're under the influence? It's a mess, and it's made further a mess because our state legislature let each county and each entity help set some of their own <coughs> rules. So it's a circus. I think they need to straighten that out, have a consistent set of rules. It is a mess, and... Uh, I have to agree with Gordon, I don't have a great solution for this because we didn't make the mess, we just get to inherit it. Boy, that's for sure. All right, Doug, pound your head on the microphone. Oh, gosh, yeah. All right. yeah. You know, this is one of those issues where I, traveling is important. If you're not at the table, you're on the menu. And frankly, I've made sure that we've been at the table for the last three years. And that's very important here. We are talking with the federal side to find out on the get it off the schedule one piece to move it so that we can do research on it. The second half on that is I sit on the OLCC Rules Advisory Committee that has basically made all the recommendation for the administrative law to the commission, OLCC commissioners on the implementation of recreational marijuana. And we just finished up the new laws here just a few days ago on how the medical marijuana is going to be brought into the system. Now, there is a cost to Jackson County, like it or not. You have a district attorney that prosecutes cases, you have the sheriff that arrests cases, you have the jail that houses cases, you have addictions recoveries that helps people come out on the backside, and like it or not, 10% of the people who use it are going to become addicted to it. That's according to our doctor here locally that is in our charge of our addictions recovery. The Delta-9 THC that is contained in marijuana is addictive at that level. How do we fund it? 
Currently, we are the GROW. The current, uh, the current law says that it's going to be funded based on a 3% sales tax the local jurisdiction can put in. They were, we were limited to that after we'd done the work here in Jackson County. We, were, we set the pace in the state, and the state legislature fought us every step of the way, every step of the way. They limited our tax down to 3%, and then they turned around and gave us a formula that basically says you're going to get a percentage of the sales of the marijuana. And if you don't opt into the program, you don't get any money, or you don't have the ability to do anything for money. So it was kind of like a hold you hostage by the state of Oregon. So you're going to have an impact, but you don't get any revenue unless you participate in all five aspects of it. So currently, we're working with the state legislature and those who have authority over that formula because we are the grow and not the sale. Everything was built on the sale. We're going to revamp that formula to reroute some money here to Jackson County to offset the costs of the code enforcement and everything else in the surveyor's office that goes with marijuana to increase that. And that's going to affect all of rural Oregon, not just Jackson County. I believe the next question came from the Excuse deputy me. DA. Oh, no. you want to? Oh, sorry. One thing that you could do is we need to be promoting hemp. It doesn't have the THC in it. It still has the medical capacity to help people. And it reduces the likelihood of this stuff being exported over state lines. So hemp is a, a, a byproduct or a product that we could be promoting in lieu of just marijuana as well. Okay, let's start with this. First of all, marijuana stays in the system five to eight days. Okay, so somebody who smokes it today isn't necessarily totally done tomorrow. For those of you that were around in the 60s, you remember the guys who dropped out? Now the stuff is way more potent. The hemp issue. Yes, it does interfere with the production of marijuana. So as recently as last night, we had dinner with someone who has a friend who is next to a grow. And they've decided to plant hemp along that side of their property because they can't seem to get any other assistance to deal with the marijuana grow that's going in. There's already been conflict. The marijuana growers, by the way, are not real happy about that because it reduces the uh, THC level. Defensive there. planting. But I right. give them credit for creativity. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, what I've heard from communities, Commissioner, so you know, I've heard them saying they were going to, before the state passed their things, tax as much as they could. And that problem drives it right back to the cartels and the illegal grows. You've got to have balance in some of this. I may not like all of it. It's a changing world, and we're adapting to the changes legally, and we have to follow the law, too. All right, thank you. I'm going to uh, go with a question submitted, I believe, from uh, David, Do David Orr, yes. running for judge. That's correct. Go ahead and stand up. We appreciate that. He's a deputy DA right now. And as a deputy, go ahead. Let me share a little bit of limelight here. Jackson County's finest, right? All right. As a deputy DA, and this is going to go to, uh, to Mr. Strasser first, uh, I can tell you that the jail space problem is critical. Even if the sheriff opened the 62 beds he recently closed, we'd still have a serious problem. How will you, as a commissioner, fix it in a timely manner? I think that's the... And Bill, Bill the, Matt, since I didn't realize that when you started your questions, that that, that would be addressed, so it's already been discussed. So, But I, I think a timely manner, though, I think that's very specific, though. Can, can I explain just quickly how, All right, go ahead. how critical this is? All right. It's... It, uh, and... Uh, uh, Mr. Strasser, you were saying that you know if it's for a nonviolent offense, you're going to get out of jail. It's not just for if you're in for a Measure 11 offense, then you'll be held. Otherwise, if you now, Bill, if you go out and your car is gone mm -hmm. and they catch the guy who did it and they arrest him, yeah, he's going to be out tomorrow. But I get a new station vehicle. He's not. What's that? But I get a new station vehicle. <laughs> just, yes, yeah, but he'll be released. He'll go gonna, steal another car, knowing he's going to be released again. Yeah, I and know. Then, and then the additional problem that we have now, it's not just that they're getting out. You know, they sign a release agreement saying, I won't commit any crimes, and you let me out. They can commit another crime, and they'll still get out again. But the worst problem that I have is I try to bring these people to trial. All they have to do is, you know, I have to subpoena witnesses. They have to, you know, take time off from their jobs. All the defendant has to do is not show up for trial. And then I've got all these witnesses there, and yes, a warrant gets issued, that person gets picked up on the warrant and gets released. Then the witness, so the trial gets postponed, the witnesses after a while say, David, you know, you told me I was going to have a trial this particular day, should I bother showing up? Can you guarantee me it's going to go this time? And I have to say, no, I can't, because the guy just, 
And so I end up having to cut a deal for this guy who, and just let him out again. It's, it's really, the problem is really urgent. So if we build another jail, I mean, that takes, takes years. And in the meantime, we need a solution. This situation is truly dire. Well, you asked for the things that I might consider doing in the short term. The first thing I'd want to look at is what kind of recruitment processes and resources are actually occurring to get people to be able to staff an old, outmoded, linear facility. Linear means they've got to go down a hallway and look in each and every cell. It's labor intensive. It is not in efficient form. Modular remote supervision, you have less people. You move people without having to physically touch them for the most part. There's a guy in a control room with specialty doors called hold, hold open doors. If there's a breach, hit a button, it goes closed. You know, you have flexibility. You have issues with juveniles, women, adults, different kinds of adults. There's all kinds of issues. So the first thing you do is step up the recruitment issue and the resources there to get people to open up that thing again to avoid the very thing you're talking about, the revolving door. What's, what's the problem? Okay, he gets released, he gets the warrant, he goes to jail, he's immediately released. We're getting the same people over and over and over and over, and that's a cost to the taxpayers too. Doug? I'm the just Community Justice Services Liaison for the county. I serve on the Public Safety Coordinating Council for the county. Um, the issue is big. And we started the process several years ago. The Justice Reinvestment Act basically was saying, hey, the prisons are getting too big. We gotta find money to be able to bring back locally. I started a public safety summit across the state, marched around the state, and was able to turn about the Justice Reinvestment Act from about $15 million to local governments to $40 million to local governments. What that does is it gives us programs to be able to do work release programs, inmate programs. I'm sure you're very well of our transition center and everything else. A lot of that's on the post side. However, it does a lot on the pre side also, and it's, we don't have the time to get into that. However, it all boils down to it's $109 a day per jail bed. Now there are jails that are close by that we could utilize, and we'd have to rent those for $109 a day. Where does the funding come from that? Yes, budget is part of it, as long as we have money. But you're also talking about arraignment and transportation for arraignment to those, uh, those, those people that have made violations. Currently we have video arraignment we just updated in Jackson County so that we don't have to transport them into the courtroom every time they can be arraigned while they're in the jail. We don't have that ability or technology right now with other jails to be able to rent that space as we move through this process for the short term. If we did, it might make things a little bit easier as we could just rent those jail beds from another county with a video arraignment working that way. But that is an option, but it would take a little bit of investment to get there. But um, one of the solutions, I believe, is reopening that bottom side. As soon as we have those personnel trained up, we're in the process of getting that recruitment right now. All I can say is watch yesterday's budget hearings uh, that we had over the last couple of days. The sheriff did a very good job on making that presentation. The budget committee talked about it, and everything's in process right now. I hear a lot of process, process this, process that. Honestly, what I would do is I would call Sheriff Joe Arpaio, I'd get a, a, a blueprint, and we'd find some land out in White City, big enough to put the tents up, the kitchen up, and they're gonna go out there and they're gonna do their time wearing pink underwear and pink jumpsuits, and that's what it takes. And, and it won't cost $50 million for a new jail. It's something that can be done within a year and we can get this problem resolved short term until we come to a long term solution. That's what you got to do. Um, I don't mind that, Gordon, as long as you get the pink handcuffs too. <laughs> now, the video arraignment that was mentioned, that's 30 plus year old technology. The city of Medford. Why hasn't it been implemented at the county? It's not that budgetarily prohibitive. Okay, I was hearing that you didn't have it. No, in other counties, you don't have that capability. Okay, in other counties, thank you. Remember, all the cities use our jail. We are the jail. I'm familiar. I was there the day video arraignment started for the city. I was in your lockup. Yeah, so you know we have it. Yes. <laughs> but what I didn't understand was what I thought I heard you say. And all of this. What we were hearing from 
the district attorney over here was the stampede for acceleration of cases being generated is somewhat of our own creation because we're not dealing with the problem. Uh, next, uh, Commissioner Breitenthal, you'll uh, take this one first. And do you think that um, we are over dependent on state and federal grants? And is this a sustainable approach to funding Jackson County programs? Well, I can say that if it's a program that's mandatory or essential services that we do here in Jackson County, our sheriff, and that's all done out of our local tax dollars. Uh, the programs that are federally funded or state funded, they ramp up and, and scale back based on that funding. Currently, uh, Affordable Care Act is doing a lot of mandates on our health and human services, specifically in mental health, and that's a big issue in the jail right now. It's probably one of the biggest issues uh, in Jackson County is mental health. People that shouldn't be in jail uh, because they're, they have mental issues and they need help somewhere else, and that helps get them out of the jail, frees up the bed. But that's a huge influx right now of federal dollars that are coming in, and we've scaled up, and you've seen us in, increase our, our budget this year to about $338 million based on that particular piece. But our, our general fund is still about $38 million. Our services that we provide, which we consider essential services, that basic core function will never be impacted because we are currently no longer timber dependent in Jackson County. So if we don't get a timber check, we're still going to be just fine. So we consider those bonuses, and we work forward in that direction. Well, that's one reason I want to work very hard to get in the timber. I think we're overtaxed here. I think any money we make in the timber should be distributed back to the property owners in here as a, in the form of a property tax relief. And I also believe that the businesses that pay personal property tax on their equipment should get a break. That would make living here more affordable and bringing businesses here more enticing. That, you know, that's very important. As far as the funding and the mandates, provided that the government sends the money to go with the mandate, that's one thing, provided it doesn't infringe on our rights and our prosperity. But other than that, if the money isn't coming with it, I would look very hard at it before I'd let it come in. I guess what's bothered me as I look at the different federal grants that we've received is there are always strings that come with it. There are things that don't really meet our needs here and we constantly deal with it. Some of it, uh, well quite frankly the biggest area is probably in our area of transportation. So you've got the Metropolitan Planning Organization which is the federal side and gets some of the funding. You've got the Rogue Valley Area Commission on Transportation which is sort of the budget keeper for them and their priorities have to match and the jurisdictions have to all get together and they fight over what they're going to get and be doled out by the federal government and some of the other transportation entities. Uh, if you've ever wondered why some of the things are the way they are on Barnett, you know, here in Medford, that's part of the strings of some of the money we got and uh, that's why we're developing all of these multimodal transportation things with the bike lanes and everything else, seven foot sidewalks. How many of you can walk on a five-foot sidewalk? Okay. These fights have gone on ad infinitum. So it's, it's probably something that's going to continue in the area of transportation, but always be wary of what the strings are and what you're taking. Can I clear one thing Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Doug. There was a comment made that basically alluded that we would have authority over personal property tax. We don't. As a commissioner, we don't. That's a state law. Um, our previous assessor that just left us, I was working with Josh to try to write some new legislation to be able to eliminate that before he left. Uh, but that's going to take st state legislation to get that personal property tax so that we're, we don't have to collect it. Because right now we're mandated to do that. We don't have a choice. All right. Next question. With no private venture coming, this will be directed to, uh, to Gordon. With no private venture coming forward so far to build a conference center in Jackson County and past failures in other uh, area construction projects, do you support another attempt to construct one, a conference center, and what is the taxpayer's or county role? If yes, why? If you're not, why not? 
Bill, I have read at least a half a dozen articles. I've done my own research. You know, these convention centers are pink elephants. They are something from the past. Right now with the internet and uh, all the technology that's evolving, and then you throw in the fact that the city of Medford, our airport, reaches six cities. It would be multiple transfers to get here for a large convention. It is not feasible. I don't need to spend $100,000 to study it. It's a waste of state money. That was a grant that came from the state, but it's still a waste of taxpayer money. Absolutely not. It's, it makes as much sense as spending 300000 studying a water park in the city of Medford that would only function for four and a half to five months, and then the people turned it down. You have to be a good steward of the people's money, and I would not be wasting your money. I don't waste my own. I would treat yours like my own. Thank you. A couple of things. We're talking about a conference center. And this is really, at this point, as I see it, not a county issue. If the city of Medford and their elected officials have decided to do that, I would do it the service of reading it to see what it had to say before I made a decision. And I'm not an expert on convention or conference centers. And I've read the same material that you folks have probably read too. And in fact, we had a survey and a study done in the early 2000s. There were five cities studied, three of them had convention centers, or three of them, uh, three of the five convention centers required a subsidy. I'm not in favor of a subsidy by the public to support this. In terms of the water park, the money for that study, by the way, was provided by the Parks Foundation, not the city of Medford. And what I supported in that was a vote of the people to see if they wanted to do it or not. In other words, I wanted to ask them. And they told us, and that's fine. That gave us the answer. I can't resist this. Water parks are like tents for jails in Jackson County. They're only good for about five months of the year because we freeze the other part. <laughs> the. Uh, Sorry, I shouldn't have even gone there. The convention center, if it's a private organization that wants to come in and do a convention center and they can find a way to make it work, great. Make it, make it work. A subsidy to make it happen? Uh, not out of Jackson County, I can tell you that. It would never happen under my watch. Uh, the, it, Bob was correctly right. It is not a county issue. It's not something we weigh in on. Now, with that being said, we were at talks at one point in time before the turn, the downturn of the economy. There was a private sector that wanted to do a convention center over by the airport. Now, that was not going to be subsidized by the county. It was wholly funded by the private side, and they even were putting talking about putting skyways in across Biddle over to the airport. So, is there a possibility for a bank convention center to come here? Potentially. The size of it, I could not tell you. All I can do is tell you this. I've been in charge of the Republican Party for quite some time, and I couldn't bring the state convention to Jackson County because we didn't have a facility big enough. On the national side, I wanted to bring commissioners from all over the country here to Jackson County. I don't have a place to have 400 people with hotel rooms and meeting space. Does something need to be done? Something needs to be done to be able to have some kind of meeting facilities. Does it need to be a full-size convention center like some people are making it out to say? I don't think so. Subsidies from the government? No. The private sector will figure out how to make it work if it's feasible. I think that's the point. If it's really a great deal, the private sector will build it and support it. And that's basically the position I took back in the early 2000s. And with regards to the, uh, the tent jails, it isn't meant to be comfortable. You know, I go hunting, I go out and I split the wood in the wintertime to keep my butt warm. And these people would need to be working to feed themselves and to keep their butt warm as well. It is not a hotel. They need to be taken care of and kept off of the street. Let me, um, let me interject at least a question on that that just came to mind here. Uh, I, I recall talking to someone who was running for judge a number of years ago, I forget, maybe Judge Joe Charter uh, at that time. 
And I seem to recall something that, uh, you know, when I would ask him a question about that, that there was uh, talk that in this state, given our uh, stance in uh, very much a, a lefty take on judicial issues, that it would probably be a non-starter. What would you think about that? There's no way that they would uh, let the Arizona tent-style jail here. At least that's what he said at that time. So the county wouldn't have a say in it? Oh, well, you could certainly. I think the implication was that, sure, the Jackson County could try to do it, but then uh, you get uh, just smacked down by the state at some point. Well, I would, I would have to investigate that very closely. You know, I mean, uh, if they're going to limit our, our ability to deal with these criminals, then we should just ship them to Salem and they can go in the state pen up there. <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm not even going to go there. <laughs> but here's what I can say that we have done. In the last couple of years, Jackson County invoked a constitutional, Oregon constitutional provision that allowed us to take our inmates and put them on a work release program. Essentially, they get to go home at night, but they have to come work for Jackson County every day. So it's not like they are, don't have some kind of uh, restitution. And then when we take them, we put them in work crews, and we rent them out, and we basically use them and we get paid for their labor. They don't receive anything for that. So that's what's currently going on in Jackson County. One third of our community justice program is funded by that process. It's about, well, I can't say one third completely, but it's about almost $700,000 annual income into our community justice that we're receiving here as Jackson, that you are receiving as a citizen of Jackson County for them paying restitution by doing that work. They're going out there, they're cleaning right of ways along railroads, they're, they're working on fire lines, and they're going through job, job training process so they're, they're learning skills so they, it reduces their uh, recidivism, uh, basically saying they're, they're more likely to repeat again in the future based going through these processes. So we can just lock people up all day long and that what, what science has told us, we lock them up, they get done, they go out, they commit another crime, they want more, three more hots and a cot. So if we've put them in programs that make them work, and we educate them, and then we, and we find ways to be able to get them back into that workforce, what it's showing is they're, they're more likely not to reoffend, And that, I think that's the big key in reducing cost in our jail. I'm going to go back to the original point. First of all, if they're making that re much revenue, I hope they can devote some to getting some more staff to the jail. <laughs> the second thing is, it's not keeping them in jail, and then when they're released, eventually, they go out and commit another crime. They're getting turned around almost immediately based on the scale they use to evaluate them. That's the problem. We're creating our own monster. All right, very good. Uh, next question. Next question, I believe Bob. You're going to start with this one. Gordon's not raising his hand, so I guess it's me. All right. <laughs> hey, you know, it's been going pretty well here so far. So, uh, Bob, what would you, I'm going to combine uh, one question here with an audience question. And it, it, in fact, I would say maybe a couple of minutes, up to a couple of minutes to respond to this for this reason. What would you do to reduce restrictions on private property as a county commissioner? And what do you believe could be done to restore property rights taken away by Senate Bill 100 and also the gutting of Measure 7, uh, 37 via the passage of Measure 49? So any thoughts? Go ahead and go into the property argument. I don't have that much aspirin with me, okay? In terms of Measure 37, Senate Bill 100, you know, it was a good, good intentioned effort to do things to preserve some of our state, and it's been taken over by some of the Department of Land Conservation and Development who are not elected officials. They make decisions that have the force and effect of law. And we live with those consequences. Yes, we get to appeal it, but by that time, they've already rendered their verdict and it's hard for us to move forward. In terms of the fees and the development, once again, I said it had to be reasonable, there has to be a connection with what's charged, and you've got a probably 50% of the population here that says whoever is doing development needs to pay the cost of their development. They don't want it placed on the back of the other citizens. They call those system development charges usually, they're for extra capacity, and uh, they're never fully covering 
the costs of some development, and they're never going to. There are some other benefits from the development, but they don't cover the cost. What I want is that the process is reasonable, there's a connection directly between the service provided, what that service costs. And if it's not reasonable, that we look at it and change it. There have been some things here in the city of Medford that have been changed because they were excessive. And I think you take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I don't know that we've taken a good look at those fees. Perhaps Commissioner Breidenthal can take a shot at that when he's up as to when the last review of some of the fees we charge occurred. And if we raise them, how was there a scale? Was there an index that we tied them to? And in your opinion, is it reasonable? Can you say the question again? Oh, sure. <laughs> Uh, what would you do to reduce restrictions on private property and what could be done to restore property rights that have been stripped by Senate Bill 100, Measure 37, and 49? Those who know I've been in the fights, David Smith's here, he, we fought the Measure 37 stuff years ago. Um, do exactly what we started on. I talked earlier as a commissioner, you have judicial authority, quasi-judicial authority, and it's, that's, this is the place where you have that authority. And why is it important to understand that judicial authority? Because when you do, you're the only person that has the ability to define what a word means within the law. Because you wrote the law, it's your law. So with that being said, we had a case last week up on Foots Creek. I was able, to, the question was, was this land unique? And because it's, the definition of unique was so critical, it decided it was either going to be unlocked and turned into residential or remain 20-acre EFU. So my definition of unique is now on record, and it allows other people to use that definition to be able to unlock their land and turn it into real residential. It was precedent setting. People don't realize it yet, but I'm sure when the land use people understand it, they'll catch on. The other piece of it here is a lot of people don't understand the land use laws very well. It's taken me years to really grasp them, and, and that's living within the system. There's a very rarely used situation that developers use, and the reason I know about this is because a lot of people you don't know, I owned Western Builders, Jackson County Builders, and Bridenthal Homes. I had three corporations that I was the president, CEO, and owner of. So the private sector, I am very, very comfortable making a paycheck and signing the front side of that paycheck for a lot of people because I created a lot of jobs. But you can enter into, as a government, can enter into a development agreement despite the city or despite anything else. And that can enter in directly with that developer. We can specify what that development will look like. The concept of this is you can look at White City. White City is actually Jackson County. It's not an incorporated city. We manage White City. It has a city streets, curb, sewer, gutter, the whole shooting match. Now, let's take and talk about affordable housing and everything and how we're going to unlock some of this stuff. There's properties around Ashland. Ashland refuses to increase their urban growth boundary. It drives the prices through the roof. No one can afford to live in Ashland. The county can literally enter into an development agreement with a property right outside the city of Ashland and create an addition and tie it right back into their city and tie it into their streets and everything. So if you want to understand how the land use law works, you got to be able to work as a builder and then as a commissioner, as a judge, to be able to figure it out. Because I tell you, it's taken me a lifetime to get to where I'm at right now. And I'm just unlocking some of this stuff right now in Jackson County. All right. Gordon. Well, when we talk about system development charges, you know, if we want to reduce the burdens on businesses coming into town, I say we should come up with the charges. They are what they are, whether it be 500000 or a million dollars, but you don't charge the customer that up front. You add that value to his assessed value on his property. He pays it off 3% or the, the, the assessed tax rate for his property. And if he sells that property, it gets clean. The slate gets clean. Let's lower the hurdles for companies and businesses and people to get in here and start creating manufacturing jobs. We gotta think outside the box. Yes, I do believe those fees for services need to be paid for. But we're currently not at capacity for water, we're not at capacity for sewer, and we can 
let those fees pay, be paid for over time. If they do sell the business or the property, the fees will, the fees will be paid off at the time of close. That's the way I see it. Doug, you wanted to... Yeah, Bob asked it. You asked a question. Yeah, you asked a question on the fees and everything like that. We review them annually. All the fees are reviewed annually. We have policy that we don't subsidize businesses in Jackson County. Uh, we don't believe in that subsidy process. When you talk about reducing system development charges, that means you're using taxpayer dollars to subsidize business. And that's what that means. So let's do a direct translation. Reduced fee equals government subsidy. Because frankly, that fee currently is reviewed annually and it's looked at the hard cost of what it actually takes for us to do that service for that individual business. So if it takes five man hours or, or, or personnel hours, excuse me, to say that it's a review of this, uh, I know you're laughing. <laughs> it, it takes five hours to review of these plans then we charge a fee that's appropriate with five hours and the computer work and everything else associated with it. But we don't allow your tax dollars to subsidize that, that, uh, that builder or anybody else because now you're giving that business an incentive out of your tax dollars. And that's, we don't believe in the subsidy that way. That's why we do it when we do it. All right. I don't believe it's a subsidy. It's a restructuring of the payment of that fee. Okay. You know, just a second. Hold on, hold on. Give it another try. Instead of getting that money up front, we're going to get our money, but we're going to make it easier for them to open up the business, build the business, and that's what we need to do. It's currently, you know, as a contractor myself, the fees and regulations are the number one most expensive item. You can ask any home builder what's the most expensive item when it comes to building a home. It's the SDC fees. It's not the appliances in the kitchen. It's not the plumbing. Unless you're building on the side of the hill in a foundation, it's the SDC fees. Let's, let's rearrange them so that you're getting paid, so that the city or the county is getting paid for them, but let's reduce the hurdle as a cost of doing business. I think what I'd have to say is I think that's a formula for disaster. If you think back about the downturn in the economy, that would leave a lot of debt for all of you because the city would have to pick it up, the county would have to pick it up, everybody would pick it up, and quite frankly, there's a lot of people who have gone into business that haven't even paid their taxes. I'm sorry. They're, businesses go down. They don't always make it. Sometimes it's not because they weren't trying hard. Sometimes it's just because things were beyond their control. In that downturn in the economy, I mean, how many homes do we still have out here that are owned by banks and lenders? And by the way, on that re in that note, uh, there was a recent article where it talked about how they really had no control over maintaining those properties because they had asset management companies. No, those asset management companies report to them. They still have control over that, and that's where the buck stops for those lenders. So, Mr. Charleston, with respect, I would disagree that that's a wise financial idea. And not, not to mention it doesn't comply with state law. All right. Next is going to be a three-part question. Triple bagger. I want to try to get some of these out pretty quickly. I think they're kind of related here. So, Doug, you'll uh, field this one first. Okay. Get there. And you'll have 15 minutes to answer. Just kidding. Uh, <laughs> How strongly do you support the principle of sustainable development? Also part of that, do you consider hydropower a renewable energy source? Look. Now, speaking of dams uh, and, and hydropower, the proposed removal of dams on the Klamath, is this a threat to Jackson County? Describe the threat, tell us what Jackson County should do about it. If you don't think it's a problem, tell us why not. <laughs> Now, my definition of sustainable development or the uh, environmental group's definition of sustainable development? Okay, I want you to, cha <laughs> I want you to channel Jeff Merkley and Bernie Sanders. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Merkley just came out for Hillary. For no, Sanders. No, actually, for Merkley Bernie. just came out for Sanders. Yeah, for, yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's why I say channel. I can't do that. Okay. That's just so far out of my, I'm, I'm too far <laughs> centered than I am. That's just boring. <laughs> Sorry. Well attempted anyway. So the, the sustainable development is that a lot of people have talked about these uh, 
Well, Medford's going through it right now, Little Houses. <laughs> and I'm sorry, it doesn't work too well. I, I, I have some issues with it. Uh, that's why I sort of find alternative ways of dividing our uh, land and I look at development agreements and I find alternative ways to get things done here in Jackson County. Hydropower. I am a very big fan of hydropower. I think hydropower is something that we can utilize here in Jackson County. Um, we have some opportunity here coming up from um, being able to, in our irrigation ditches to install hydroelectric power plants that would actually uh, be the benefit of Jackson County and they would end up paying for themselves. They'd pay for that infrastructure over time. Removal of dams. Remember I worked in Klamath Falls for 20 years while I lived here in Jackson County. I was there with the Bucket Brigade. I, so I know what that's all about. I don't support the removal of the dams. I, I don't believe that we should be subsidizing them off our power bills either like we have been to pay for that removal. Those are owned by the electric utilities and if they want to remove them because they want to comply with some sort of new federal regulation or something that they're trying to create, uh, then they should pay for it and they should take the, take the hit on it. Um, but the removal of those dams I don't think should happen. I opposed the removal of Gold Ray Dam at that time. I don't know if anybody remembers that. Um, if we, were, if we lost that battle, but uh, David, well, a, a big friend of mine, Jack Swift, I don't know if many of you remember Jack, he was a big uh, advocate of keeping the dams also. We had kind of all fought together. He just passed away here recently. Big loss, uh, lands rights activist. But I couldn't stop from mentioning his name. Um, so that's kind of where I'm at. I don't, is it a threat, though? Do you consider it a threat in Jackson County? The removing of the dams? Yeah. Yes. And here's why. Much like the litigation that the Klamath tribe did, and they obtained the water rights over our Four Mile Lake water. So as we own the water rights in Jackson County, we have the stored water. But all the snowpack on the east side of McLaughlin in that watershed now belongs to the tribe. And any time they want to make call on that water, all that water is going to be diverted over to the Klamath Lake to fill. And they did that last year. Now, that hurts us at time of drought. Now, the removal of the dams on the Klamath River, we have the Yurok tribe and it's going, that's doing a lot of the same things, and there's some designations of wild and scenic that they're trying to put in place on that river also, and some that they already have. When you say that wild and scenic designation, what happens is there's established stream flow or river flow at a specific height that has to be maintained at all times now because of that wild and scenic beauty piece. It has to, that's the way they look at it. So once that stream flow designation is established, that means all water has to be diverted above that to be able to maintain that level. Now when the tribe adjudicates the water right, and they have the ability of the adjudication to, or win that, or if they are successful to win that adjudication on the Klamath River, and you do remove the dams, what happens is, is now we have lost our water up on the four mile piece, and now the Jenny Creek drainage, does everybody know Jenny Creek, uh, Howard Prairie? up in that area, the Jenny Creek, Highway 66. All that water, actually portions of that watershed drain into the Klamath River. So instead of us being able to maintain, we would have to let water out based on the call of a different tribe to be able to go down and divert into the Klamath River. So that has me very, very, very afraid at the moment. I've been monitoring it closely, especially since we've been dealing with the drought years. I am the liaison for the county to all the water resources for the state and how we do that work. But that's what has me terrified. If they're successful in that adjudication, I'm afraid that our investments and our recreation and our, our water up in that area will go away. And just so everybody knows, the water is actually carried forward. We have the, the Four Mile Lake, it's pumped into Fish Lake and comes into Agate on that side, but we also have the drainages coming in and some it's diverted over to the Howard Prairie Hyatt side. And then it comes down in through a series of small reservoirs into Immigrant Lake. And that's our agricultural water for Jackson County. And maybe the uh, better question to ask, I don't know if anyone's gonna really argue about this, but what can we do as a commissioner? I'm trying to what we I know we're running out of time, yeah, that's why it's, I'm just trying to... It's so, it, it, the hard part is it's federal and it's all done in BIA, on uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs in, in that type of litigation. So 
just like we fought the water issue up on the Four Mile Lake drainage, we can fight it and we can demand the coordination side if it goes that way, mm -hmm. but we have to be early on, and that's what we're trying to get at the table early, and we've got them a degree to that we're going to stay at the table. And so that's the but challenge I think right that's now, the okay. challenge right now is, is finding that avenue. It's, it's all right. ugh, complicated, because all the water in the state of Oregon is actually owned and controlled by the state of Oregon, not the county. All right. Let's uh, have uh, Gordon take a stab at this too. The triple bagger, sustainable development, hydro renewable, and danger of the dam. What would you do as a commissioner? Sustainable development is not sustainable to the taxpayer or the private sector. All you have to do is look at the three fire stations that we budgeted $10.9 million, and because the, the university system coming down and putting in their sustainable development ideas, City of Medford, excuse me, and now we can only afford two of the three that we were budgeted for. It's not sustainable. As far as hydropower, I do believe it is a renewable power, but the state of Oregon doesn't recognize it as one. Uh, with regards to the uh, KBRA, we're going to be in trouble. Uh, if those dams get removed, it's going to adversely affect our irrigation water here gravely. But, you know, with the uh, climate that it is, the way it is, I believe that we should be working very hard on building storage reservoirs. So when the water's running high and fast, we can capture some of this water so that we can use it during the drier periods of the year. Okay, I think we just heard that all the water is owned by the state of Oregon. When water comes onto a property and potentially could leave the property and you're gonna dig holes to impound it, You've got some serious problems with the state of Oregon, so I'm not sure that that is going to pass muster. And if you talk about property rights and other rights, like water rights, you'll be affecting someone else. We recently had a case, it was not a Medford Water Commission case, but you probably all heard about it, with Harrington, where he had a couple of ponds. He was impounding water that was flowing onto his property that other people had water rights to. And it was described as small ponds. Actually, I don't know why he had a ski boat on one. But... The issue is, if you say you respect property rights, then you have to consider the whole picture. So let's go back to, you know, the sustainable issue and hydropower and Four Mile. Four Mile, by the way, some of the argument is that they deserve to have that because of the dry weather and the water flows that they needed in their historical dry weather flows. That's artificially created. There never were historical dry weather flows out of four mile. As far as the dams, there were five. Only one is actually producing any appreciable energy. Do I dislike the removal? Yes, because the irrigators, the farmers, they're the people that are going to be hurt. There is a project here because we're trying to conserve water. It's called the WISE Project, Water for Irrigation Streams and Efficiency. It's expensive. They're trying to enclose some of the open ditches so you don't have all the loss the seepage out of it so that the irrigators can capture more water of what's available because water is a precious resource. Let's talk about the cities and where they get their water and that. First of all, Medford Water Commission supplies a number of them. They get the water from the Big Butte Springs. They get it from the river. And there's only a certain amount of it that they can get. So when they get it from the river, they're really getting storage rights in Lost Creek. What if Lost Creek doesn't have water? you've got a problem. And we've got the issue of fish persistence and the CFS, cubic feet per second, that's got to be maintained. Lost Creek is an integral piece of the water we have. That's the water that eventually goes down and is treated by the treatment plant for the city of Medford, the Medford Water Commission. The Water Commission is actually a separate entity from the city under Chapter 19 of their charter. So all of these are very important we have been able to have the lowest sewer rates basically in the state, some of the lowest water rates in the state by the effective management of what we've done. But water is the gold of the future. What was the old saying? Whiskey's for drinking, water's for fighting. All right, very good. All right, uh, audience question here. And uh, Gordon, you're the person up here right now. A person says, I like the idea of allowing the fees associated with building a home to be paid off in payments. 
And why not make the lending bank responsible for paying off the unpaid fees in the event of a default? It almost sounds like you're talking about a lien of some sort. Well, the way I see it, I mean, there would be a lien placed against the property if the fee was uh, placed in the assessed value and paid off over time. Mm -hmm. The county would have that lien right, actually, and not the bank, because the county or the uh, department would be the one that would be owed the money. Okay. Bob, you want to comment on that? Yeah, well, let's just take into consideration the fact you place a lien on a property during a downturn that loses value. What are you going to get on that lien, and what position are you with that lien? You're probably not in first position. All right. Doug, do you want to uh, comment on that? You're still subsidizing. It takes taxpayers' dollars to do it because you still have to do the development up front. All you're doing is just deferring those costs and using tax dollars to make that happen up front. And if you get that downturn, it doesn't pay for itself. If the bank defaults, I've seen a lot of houses default. I've seen banks default. I've seen how many times you've seen the banks change names around here. Uh, so, I, I mean, I hate to say it like that. I, I'd rather have it secure. A banner. A banner. <laughs> oh my gosh. Really? Yeah. Well, yeah. What is banner now, by the way? I forget what it used to be. So I'd rather see you know, those fees uh, there really need to be able to pay for that development, have that developer pay for it, and be up front so the taxpayers are not at risk of losing any money. All right. Uh, I'm just going to do a couple of questions. I mean, there's a lot of great questions here, limited time. And uh, kind of a personal question. Bob, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, something that we may not know about you, something that we don't know about you that you think might uh, be key, your position as a county commissioner if you were elected. Well, I hope the thing that you do know is a sense of ability to communicate. I mean, that's the one thing I carry forward from the law enforcement days. But the thing you may not know is the sense of humor and the desire to interject a little bit of humor at times when things are contentious and tough. And there was an Irish gentleman that I once worked with on the council. He says, well, if you can't be smart, at least be polite. And you know, you need to keep, keep yourself grounded with what you're doing and remember who you're representing and what you're doing. And that it's not personal. When you're working in an environment with several electeds, you do your best. You, if you didn't get it the way you wanted, obviously you didn't do the best. But there are some you're going to lose and some you're going to win, so you might as well keep your sense of humor. All right. Doug, something we don't know about you that uh, perhaps the voters uh, should know. Gosh, that's a tough one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's an interest. I just thought it was kind of an interesting question. I like wow. punk rock. I'm trying to think what would I say. <laughs> well, well, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. Kevin's shaking his head. No. Um, no, that had to go with a, a comment today. We approved a, a mass gathering for a reggae music festival, and I asked any guy who goes, no punk rock? and no heavy metal. And I said, what if I like punk rock? <laughs> he just sat there, ah. <laughs> Poor guy, put him on the spot. Uh, you know, I have an inherent ability to really get along and get things done. I don't think people really understand how much I can accomplish and how many offices that I really have access to at the state and national levels. Uh, and the influence that I really carry on that national side through the national associations. We do a lot of good work, and, I don't, and a lot of that is basically, I never really talk about it, I don't go out and brag about it, I don't really say things. Even Bill has a hard time dragging it out, dragging it out of me on the, on the radio shows because I don't, I don't talk about what I do. And everybody tells me, hey Doug, this is such really great work, you need to get out there and say it. You need to come out and tell people what you're doing, they'll be amazed. And I said, but I, have, I can't talk, tell people what I'm doing, it's the results that I come up with that I, I like to show people. Because I just don't brag about myself. And it's maybe it's too many years in working in the fire department that you just, you just sort of go in there, you do the job, you get done, and then, then you wash your hands when you're all said and done, and people see the aftermath on the backside. And they're, they're happy because they're, the event's done and they're taken care of. So I have always had that kind of inside of myself saying, just take care of people, do the right thing, and everything will work fine in the end. Because technically, there's no emergency here in government. It's, it's, I know what an emergency is. And that usually involves life and death. So I take a really nice, a pragmatic approach to everything and, and take that approach that there's no emergency. Gordon. Well, 
here's something that nobody knows. That if I'm elected county commissioner, I'm not going to take the full wage. I'm going to give $21,000 annually back to the county. The people of this county are meeting income of 36000 I don't think that they can afford these high-paying government officials. It's going to cost me money to become an elected official. I'm going to have to hire people to replace me at my job and my business. But I'm willing to do it for the people. You know, I got to tell you, you know, nobody knows, but when I went to college, I got my Bachelor of Science degree done in two years. I'm a very motivated person. When I make up my mind to do something, I get in there and I get it accomplished and I get it done. I've been doing that for 23 years in the construction industry, meeting projects on budget and on schedule. I'm very motivated, always have been my heart, my life, and I'm a hardworking fellow. I want to work for you every day out there, and I think I'd be the best candidate for it. Thank you. All right, now we're into the final two questions, and I appreciate you having come here tonight to learn more about the candidates. And this is, uh, I'm going to combine two, once again, sort of a closing statement. Why should we vote for you for county commission? And if elected, how will you know you've been a success? I think it's an interesting way to, you know, what would you use as your metric? And Doug, you go first. Well, if you look at what I've done over the past three years, that's a good indication of what to expect in the future. Uh, took, came into office with a deficit budget, turned it around. Came into office with our reserve accounts draining, turned them around. Oh, over the last three years, we've done almost $70 million worth of capital improvements, and we have not charged the taxpayers an extra dime or asked the taxpayers for an extra dime. So when we talk about those jails and we talk about ways of getting things done, we, I, I have experience on how to do that we, and because we've demonstrated that over the last few years. I bring a unique experience working on the federal management teams on the land that nobody else can bring forward. The, co the coordination concepts and the land use concepts that we're working so hard to get back into the woods I alluded to it earlier, but we're on the cusp of actually making a difference. My predecessors for 20 years tried to get this done, and that's one of the reasons why the, my colleagues at the national level put me to where I am, is because my knowledge and skill set to actually get that work done. <laughs> to be at that national level taking the presidency in May is so rare for a first-term commissioner, and it's the first time in Jackson County's history that's ever happened. But the commissioners from those 15 states basically said, you're the person to move this stuff for us. And do you think there's a lot of knowledge there? They're, they're amazing people, brilliant people. So as we move forward, if you want to see that land unlocked, I need to finish that work. We lose that position if I'm not reelected. We lose that influence because you have to be a seated commissioner to maintain that position. And frankly, my experience with public safety, the fact that I've been on the ground working for the last three years on our public safety and judicial program, I was calling for reviews before everybody else was even understanding what the reviews were going to happen and looking for. They were, they were thinking it was for some other reason. So I have this unique ability to be able to look out at about 60 to 120 months. All my decisions are made for five to ten years out. Because I have this opinion that if we're doing this this year, you're already behind the curve. If you're thinking 48 to 36 months, you're already so far behind the curve, you'll never get there. Uh, so those are some of the reasons. I could go on and on and on, but like I said, it's hard to talk about oh, yourself. Yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you, Doug. We appreciate that. Now, uh, Gordon, same questions here. Why should we vote for you, County Commissioner? Kind of a closing statement. and. How would you know if you are elected that you have been a success? What would be your metric? Well, my measure of success would be if the people of the county are more prosperous and freer. You know, he, he, my candidate or opponent here talks about public safety being his priority. Are we safer now than we were four years ago when he came elect when he was elected? I say resoundingly no. 
Are we more prosperous now than when he was four years ago? I say resoundingly no. You know, there's a lot of people that talk the talk, but I walk the walk. I've been creating family wage jobs for 23 years in this county. We need some action, not just words. And I'm sorry, and it's, that's just, I'm not a politician. I'm a doer. I build things, I complete things, I get it done. And we need somebody in office that will stand up and fight for you and not worry about the policy, worry about the product. Let's get this stuff done. Nothing here in this county can't be accomplished but you have to quit worrying about what some bureaucrat timeline is. We've got to get in there and shake it up. And that's something that's not being done. We need some fresh blood in there with fresh ideas, thinking outside the box. And, you know, and I'm not going to worry about being reelected. I'll tell you, when I become county commissioner, I want to hire a full-time staff person so that he can move. His sole purpose in life is to get us in the woods. So if I don't get elected or if I get in trouble, guess what? When I leave, it's still being worked on. We need to be dedicated and have somebody that's doing that. We got $2.1 million in, in revenue from them. Let's hire a staff person. He answers to the commissioners, and his sole purpose is to get us back in there, locally manage our resources. Thank you. First of all, let me start with this. I've been a citizen volunteer for a lot of years, all of it unpaid. I've got the passion and desire to do it, Public safety, I obviously have a proven record there and knowledge. Property rights, I've been president of the local association of realtors. I belong to the Home Builders Association. I'm certainly well imbued in that. And as a proven policymaker for a public entity, I don't know that anybody has 16 years of doing that straight. I have never sought office just to get re-elected. In fact, of the four elections on city council, I had a higher percentage each of the four elections. I had a simple credo, you do what's right. And I think that stood well. People recognized it and appreciated it. I was also plain spoken at times, including when the city council asked for a raise. And I said, who told you? It was a burning question on the mind of the public to pay you. I suggest that they go out and get a petition circulated and show me that that was really what was needed. In terms of the county commissioners, sorry, with all due respect to the gentleman sitting up here, I think the salary is high. I'm also troubled by the fact there is a quorum of two. I'd almost rather have five and divide the salary for the three among the five. The last thing I want to say is I ask for your consideration of vote I will be here serving you, and I will be accountable and responsible to you. I will be accessible. Once again, I want your voice to be heard. I want you to feel like it was important. It doesn't mean we're always going to agree, because I am plain spoken, but it does mean I want to hear what you have to say. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes tonight's Candidates Forum. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Doug Breitenfeld. Thank you, Gordon Chalstrom. Thank you, Bob Strasser.